Welcome back to Parenting in the Trenches. Uh, in our series on adoption, we are continuing our discussions around the impact of attachment trauma and what we can do to help our kids when we are in the midst of repair and rebonding and creating safety for connection. Um, I'm speaking again today with Renee, lovely Renee, who has been a guest with me before. Um, you can check the show notes out for her contact information as well in case um, you're looking for more information. Uh, but today, Renee is actually going to talk to us about uh, somebody else's uh, developed theory and approach to working with kids who have come from hard places. She's going to talk with us about the PACE approach, and I'm going to ex let her explain the details of this in our conversation, but I just wanted you to know um, what it is developed for and that it was developed by Dr. Daniel Hughes and uh, that he also has a book. And if you're interested in learning more, you can check out the show notes for a link to that resource as well. Renee holds a master of, Master's of Arts in Counseling from UBC, and she's a registered clinical counselor. She's immersed in research um, as a researcher, a writer, an avid reader of current research literature, and she has founded a few projects, a few organizations. One is positive body image nonprofit organization called Free to Be Talks, and that um, came out of her master's degree thesis, and it helps youth across North America. She's also the co-founder of Care for Women, which is a not-for-profit organization that supports new mothers. In addition to private practice, she also works on a trauma-informed team for complex trauma resources, supporting kids and families who have been adopted or are in foster care. She's a mom of four children of her own, both biological and adoptive, and she's passionate about child development from in utero through adolescence. The experiences that we have throughout our life can be for profound in terms of lifelong echoes as we grow older, and this has led her to doing such incredible work in this area. Her work aims to support parents and kids to ensure that they have strong relationships, optimal social skills, capacity for emotional regulation, and as a coherent sense of identity. She works with a variety of concerns with kids, youth, and adults, including anger, anxiety, attachment disruptions, body image concerns, eating disorders, um, identity development, parent-child relationships, and trauma, developmental or other forms of trauma as well. In addition to her clinical practice, she leads workshops, presentations in the area of body image and trauma. So I'm not going to read any more. I want you just to meet her. Okay, Renee, thank you for coming back. You've been here before. So this thank is you nice. Having We're having me. another secondary conversation on a new topic. Um, we, I know that you have had personal experience working with Dr. Daniel Hughes' approach. And so I thought that it would be great to have a conversation with you to kind of hit the milestones or the guideposts of this approach, because you have spoken so highly of how that was a game changer and that you use this in your practice with people um, as a therapist. And so I thought, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what this approach is, what it means for our actions with our kids. And um, yeah, so would you maybe start us off with the foundational guidelines of what, how would you describe this approach? Sure. Well, it's always great to chat with you. I love, I love our conversations that we have. And to start off, what, what PACE stands for is it's playfulness acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And really, it's total acceptance of the child's inner experience about what's going on. So their wishes, desires, thoughts, dreams, it's not evaluating what's going on with, with the child and where they're at. And I think even before we get into pace, but like, why is pace so critical for healing? It's because well, relationships are central to who we are as, as people, as beings, and, be, and starting from infancy onward, we need people. We need people in our lives. And so when we're thinking about trauma and we're thinking about particularly like complex trauma, 
So kids who have had really hard experiences and it's often done, uh, the experience is often interpersonal in nature, sometimes at the hands of the caregiver. If we think about how a baby comes into this world, wired up, completely dependent on its caregivers, I'm going to kind of go right back to the beginning because I think that's where you see it most clearly. And then you see the need for pace really clearly uh, after we after we look at infancy. So that a child, you know, has thousands and thousands of experience in the first few months alone of their life where they learn about Mm -hmm. themselves. They learn, are my needs going to be met? Does my voice matter? Are the people in my life safe? Is my world safe to explore? And when this, the answer, you know, in good enough situations, if, if the answer is yes, you know, the messages that they receive from, from the caregivers, from the adults around them, the child feels safe to the child feels delighted and first of all it feels safe for who it is um it's able to reach its developmental milestones it begins it plays at appropriate times but a child who does not have these experiences ends up being in that in that survival part of their brain and Mm -hmm. i'm going to spend all this time on brain um science but i think it's really important to set the conversation up here is because our brains are built hierarchically. So later, later structures are built on earlier structures. And so if the if a child's world is, there's a lot of chaos, they're not safe, they're food scarcity or lots of caregivers, lots of unpredictability in their life. The lower parts of the brain, the part, and I'm really simplifying it here, but just to make it really yeah. Accessible, but the lower parts of the brain become on heightened alert, and it's like that bottom part of the brain has been doing push-ups its whole life, and so yeah. you you don't get the upper parts of the brain that are yeah. growing and um, connecting to the, the eventually those that higher order thinking part. So fast forward, a child's been in this case, this state for a, a, a long time or for a, a period of time. And I mean, we want to look at how chronic it is and the frequency and the intensity. But what happens with a child who has come from these places is that they is that they don't develop the capacity to reflect on why they are the way they are, why they behave the way they behave. Um, and they're often really unsuccessful in a lot of areas. Why? Because they've learned to keep themselves safe. They've learned that they've got to take care of themselves because the adults in their life failed them or the adults in their life didn't take care of them. And so they've learned that, you know, I have to take care of myself as that comes out like manipulation, bullying, defensiveness, lying. This is the child that will, you know, have the donut powder on their face and say, hey, did you take the donuts? And the child says, no, I didn't, because they'd rather deny reality than to say that they've done something wrong. They've got such a deep rooted sense of there's something wrong with me. So all of that, to pull that together is to like, why is pace so important? It's a stance of accepting the child where they're at right now in this given moment, creating safety in the relationship to be able to build a child's capacity to reflect on what's going on in their life. Why are they acting the way they're acting? Um, creating and then creating empathy to be able to deepen that conversation, and then the playfulness can, can comes in as as appropriately needed because that's a way that we can delight with one another. But that's an overarching mm-hmm. framework of like what pace is and why we can talk more about it and why it's so important in the context of helping kids make sense of who they are and what's happened to them. Yeah. And, you know, a colleague of yours that I had interviewed in another episode uh, earlier in the Neurodiversity series, um, Neurodiverse Family series of podcast episodes, we talked with uh, Dr. Chet Geddes about that, and he provided a um, a visual for us of that, those fundamental layers of uh, brain development and need meeting, right? And so we can only go up in one direction on that chart. And so when something hasn't been developed, we can't build on that. And you spoke to that, right? And so if people want to know more in depth, he does go into that in that episode. Um, and I'm also thinking about the difference between this model sounds much more developmental than chronological, right? So, th- you know, for, for parents who um, maybe haven't heard of those 
terms to kind of um, separate ways of viewing a child. It, it's kind of like the chronological ages, like, you know, when you go to chapters and you pick up, oh, what's that book called? What to expect when you're expecting or whatever. And it lays out like the first however many years of a child's life. It's what science will tell us is expected from quote unquote normal development, right? So the majority of kids will develop chronologically by age. We can expect that at, you know, 12 months they're doing this and by 18 months they're doing this and by three years they're doing this. And we're talking about a model of let's not look at the child chronologically and say, well, they're six, they should be able to sit still at their desk, they should be able to play nicely with friends, they should be able to share their toys, they should be able to, you know, pack their own lunch, whatever their expectations are of age six. We're looking at this developmentally. Yes. So where the kid is at, when you say that, I think, okay, that's developmental. We're looking at where are you on that grid of development rather than you should, there's the should, you should be at this because you're this age, right? Does that, does that fit? That's, this model? that's, that's excellent. And that's, that's a real, that's kind of one of the foundations that underlie this paradigm as well, too. It is looking at a child's age, their developmental age and saying, well, you know, and let's say in air quotes and good enough in good enough parenting situations and good enough home situations, you may, maybe you would have learned some of these milestones yet these milestones you know even sharing learning about learning about you know internal body cues about when do you have to go to the bathroom because a lot of those things are taught we don't realize that we we when you mm. those learning that sensation of when you have to void your bladder that's it are the parents around us they, they teach us when when we have to do that and yeah or the the caregivers do but when we're looking at a child developmentally, what I love, uh, there's a phrase that Dr. Daniel Hughes uses that I think is so important and re helps reframe so much of our kids' behavior, which is you haven't had time to learn that yet. Mm. And because these kids, they, they, maybe they don't remember, and this is what's so important is let's say they don't remember, sometimes they do remember depending on the the duration and the frequency and the intensity of the hard experiences and the trauma that they had. But because that brain has such a profound amount of growth in the first five years, I mean, 90% of the brain is developed at that point. That's not to say like the structures are in place and there's the right. brain is highly plastic still and can structure mm -hmm. and can continue to move and adapt. But those pivotal those foundational experiences in the first few years of life really set the foundation for how a child sees himself and and relationships and that carries on in patterns then mm -hmm. and so then you have children and i'm that are you you know in their fifth home or their 10th home i'm working with a kid right now who is um uh just over 10 years old and has just transitioned to his 15th home oh. Yeah. And you think about, you think about yeah. 15 homes that this child has been in and he's, and how little he knows about what it means to operate in a family. So basic mm -hmm. things about like, these are the, the rules and these are the expectations of how we work together in a family. This kid has no idea. And so when we look at that kid, he's chronologically 10 years old, but he's developmentally, well, he's a moving target, first of all, because when he's stressed... Yeah. He operates more like right. a toddler and yet he's got street smarts like an 18 year old. And yeah. so yes. it's trying to figure out where is a child, where is the child's developmental legs and then finding places to reach them where they're at developmentally to help heal that. And so that they can catch up, to catch up to their chronological age. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Repeat again for us what PACE stands for before we go into the next part, because I'd like You've named why it's important to do it, but I want to tangibly understand from a child's perspective what it's actually offering. Yeah. So when we do those four things, what are they, what doors can they open to safe attachment because they've sensed that's under their feet? You know, you've provided the platform. What, what are the four things and how does it feel for a kid? What are they, what are they going to use that for? So PACE, again, stands for playfulness, acceptance, 
curiosity and empathy. And you use pace to create safety, to create security within the relationship with the child so that they they engage. Okay. Part of what's something that's so powerful with pace is it's it's a conversation. It's a it's a two-way street. We we all have stories that we tell ourselves about, you know, who we are and why we're here. Mm-hmm. And kids with trauma often carry deeply embedded narratives that there's something wrong with them, that they're too much, that they're broken, that they that they need to fix things that are that they shouldn't have to fix. That yeah. And that's all outside their conscious awareness, but they behave in such a way that will push people away or they're super clingy. Um, And so when we practice pace, we take the child, we accept them for who they are, we accept their internal experience, their thoughts, their feelings, their wishes, their desires. Um, It creates this psychological safety, essentially. I mean, we still can limit behavior. That's not saying that all behavior is okay, but it it creates psychological safety to say, hey, I see you for where you're at, and I'm okay with where you're at. I'm going to meet you where you're at, and we'll go from there. Mm-hmm. Okay. That signaling is like this, um, it happens in tangible ways, right? But it's flexible in how we go about it. It sounds like there's so many ways we can language that or be with our kids that can like wrap around our personalities and our parenting styles. And, you know, it's flexible, but the, the, key core piece sounds like you're trying to inject or infuse a sense of safety, genuine safety in acceptance. So if the child feels like you're not trying to change who I am, you're trying to be with who I am, Yeah. then I will want to feel safe. I will feel safe enough to want to grow and continue to develop. And you're not privileging. So there's like the, that this is where the four parts are yeah. work all together. So sometimes playfulness isn't appropriate, especially, you know, if a kid's really heightened, um, sometimes playful, you have to be really careful with playfulness, but it is important to, um, to use it when it, when it is appropriate. Cause it's that, it's that delight in, in being with the other person. Um, it's like hopeful and it's fun, but some, but I, what I, think is really important when we're looking at the A, the acceptance, the curiosity, and the empathy piece is that it's, it, like you mentioned, so you're creating safety for the child or the, it's flexible. It's an overall attitude. It's an overall approach mm-hmm. that takes time. And it's not personal because you're constantly playing detective to what's the underlying behavior. Yeah. And you're constantly right. playing detective as to, well, why you do that and a lot of musing out loud so like what do you practically do like how do you practically create that sense of safety I mean so much of that is through our nonverbals. so much of that is through the intensity of our language the prosody of our voice whether where our eye contact is you know if we're looking at our phone while we're talking to our child um the the speed in which we're speaking all of those things all of our nonverbals convey whether we're interested in somebody so it's it's an overall attitude that's that's really embodied in our physical being as an adult, and it takes time and it takes practice because it's yeah. a, a lot of us didn't grow up with people who parented us in a in a paceful in way, in a tuned way, yeah, in a really right. attuned way, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I do think that's you know whether it was my generation or the previous one, there's a there in within a couple of generations we have really learned a lot about child development and have shifted by and large in our culture at least f- from something that was really behavioral hierarchical driven to understanding how a child internally develops and what helps them develop well that the security we don't have we're not our our goal as parents isn't to be drill surgeons to create well-behaved children. We get now that the way to have children who want to behave what we would say is well or socially, you know, mutually involved and engaged and alive in their future is not by teaching them habits as much as teaching them 
how to be themselves and with themselves through hard things, right? Like if that's our, if we're providing that kind of safety, that's where kids naturally develop. Yeah. And I think mutual, responsible, helpful, engaged, empathic adults. Absolutely. And I I think there's two points to what you just said there that are, that are worth just going back to, which is it wasn't that many years ago that there, there there was world wars and there were people were living in, in survival mechanism and we're living for in years. survival for yeah. years for survival mode. And so it makes no. sense that generations were parented in such a way because you had to worry about your imminent survival. Yeah. And, and so I think it's, that, that's really important to be mindful of so that we don't mm. create, we don't blame in and that's right. without, without cre- looking there's at There's reasons for there, this. There's, there's reasons for this yeah. and they're really, really important yeah. reasons. And at the same time, it's, it's a both end key. So we, we've learned a lot. So how does that, how does that impact in our, in our day-to-day parenting now? And I think that we need to, we have so much more, we have so much more awareness, like you were just talking about of all of these scenes here, but kids who have had trauma, they don't have that awareness. And I think okay. sometimes that's something that's missed because mm. they, they they see themselves as, well, like, this is going to be my future. This is my story. I'm a bad kid. I'm a bad seed. I'm a bad egg. And what, whatever that internal shame is that they're holding. And our jobs, especially now, um, if you're helping heal a child or you're working with a child like this, it's part of pace. I think what I, what I love about it is it's so hope filled. It holds mm-hmm. hope for the child that it doesn't have to be like this. And they're not stuck. They're not stuck. And mm-hmm. one thing that's really practical, I think that, you know, when I listen to podcasts, I really like to come up with like, well, what's a practical resource that I can, yeah, yeah. Um, a tool that I can use is speaking to the different parts of a child. So mm-hmm. a child is learning, you know, is struggling with their foster sibling, is struggling with their siblings, and they push them and they hurt them. And, you know, they're not showing any remorse for it. And, you know, you can feel stuck as a parent and you feel defensive of the other child that got hurt. And so yeah. what, what do you do? Well, you, if we're aware of a couple of things, one is that, well, the child, this child, let's say, you know, has learned to get their needs met and they've learned to do it through physical aggression, which isn't, it's not socially appropriate to do that. That does have to be, that does something that does have to change. Um, and the child's not showing remorse. Well, then you can, you can speak to different parts of that. So an example could be like, well, you know, Johnny, uh, you know, part of you probably is really pleased that you pushed Sally down and, and you, cause you really wanted this toy, but I know that there's another part of you that doesn't, that doesn't want to push Sally and hurt Sally. And I know that there's another mm-hmm. part of you that likes Sally and wants to get along with Sally. And so part of pace, I think is having this attitude of connection and attunement. So then you might even say yeah. something like, well, you know, Johnny, this is really hard for you right now. So why don't you come play right beside me? Um, and I'll help you make good choices then because this is hard to make a good choice right now. But in the way that I say it, it's totally non-judgmental. It's not meant, yeah. oh, Johnny, you're having a hard time making a choice right now. So I'm going to make your choices for you. Right. It's just accepting him that Man, this is hard for you right now. And, mm-hmm. and you're going to get it. And I'm going to help you. And I have hope for you, right. even though you don't right now. Yeah. That is the the tone sounds like I believe in you. Exactly. I see where you're at and I believe that we don't have to stay here. Exactly. Yeah. And it's teaching. It, it is teaching. So I think what's so key is that it's what I love. Dan Siegel talks about the root word of, I think it's Dan Siegel, the root word of uh, discipline, which is disciple, which is to teach. Mm-hmm. We are teaching our kids. We don't have to convey, we don't have to change their wishes or the behaviors and we know that, you know, for this example, Johnny probably did in part, he wanted to get the toy, wanted to hurt his sister. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, we know that he, he also wants to be in right relationship. Maybe he doesn't know how, because we're wired to be in relationship. Right. So as the adult, we right. constantly have to keep that in the forefront of our mind, which makes those mm-hmm. situations feel less personal and less 
they can, it can, that reframe can just help us stay grounded, which is, which can be so hard to do when you have a kid with really, really big behaviors and you're living it day in and day out. And when you gave that example, I was thinking, Kate, what a parent ultimately would love to see is the kid own the hurt they've caused, right? So like, that's what we're looking for to settle us. So if I see remorse, then I go, okay, there isn't a lecture needed because they already get that what they did wasn't ideal and they're working through how am I going to do that differently? That's what remorse will help us with, right? Mm -hmm. The lack of witnessing that or being able for a child when you say, you know, kids like this don't have the developmental access to insight, then they can't name it, let alone feel it, let alone tell you. Let alone have empathy for somebody else's experience. Yeah. They I'm don't all have in a- me right now because it's safety zone right now. I don't care. I can't care. I can't care about other people right now. And other people I have, have to work on my needs. Yes. Right. Okay. And other people have felt ha- have betrayed me. So I know that, like exactly like you said, this is safety, and I can carry it, and I can care about myself. And so it's teaching the child again. You have, you have, what I always tell parents when I'm working with them is that, you know, I'm going to have an hour of therapeutic interactions with your child, but you're going to have hundreds of them during the day. And those hundreds of therapeutic action interactions that you have during the day are going to be so powerful that have, that are going to create our work in therapy that are going to create shifts in the home that are going to be quicker or more long lasting because it's, Mm -hmm. it's an overall stance. It's an overall attitude and it's, Oh, it's an overall way of seeing yourself as a teacher um, to help your kid heal. And I think sometimes what's so hard is that you see progress sometimes in kids where they, it's like they dabble in it. They dabble in vulnerability. You have, I have lots of parents um, that will say, you know, well, we had such a good weekend or we had this really good experience. And now we're like right back to square one. Or she went around and then she, she destroyed her, this beautiful picture that we did together. Or she like, she broke my favorite vase. Like what in the world is going on? Like how in the world do we make sense of that? And going back to pace, even so I think in those situations, when it feels hurt, when it is hurtful, that's where we have to confide in an adult. You know, we get it out with a support person for us and we say, I'm so hurt right now. And then if we go back to playing detective, it's helpful to think about, okay, so Jenna, Jenna and I just had this beautiful weekend, this beautiful evening together, let's say. Maybe she can't even handle a weekend because that would be just too intense for her. But we had this really fun evening together. We felt close. She opened up to me. And, and then she sabotaged it. What does that mean? Okay. Mm-hmm. So practicing that curiosity piece one, there's two, there's a couple ways you could go about it. One could be truly going to the child and in a non-judgmental accepting way. And like, Jenna, I had such a good time with you this evening. And then I noticed that you broke this vase. Um, I'm so, I'm curious why you did that. And so it's not like you're privileging certain parts of the, like the good parts or privileging the bad parts, air quotes, bad parts of the child. And perhaps the child will tell you something, perhaps they won't. If they tell you something, then that's, you can work with what they've given you. But if they don't, um, another uh, possibility then is, well, I wonder if you were feeling really close to me and that felt good, but you're not sure if you really trust me yet. And so it's easier for you to have relationships or for it to be safe on your terms. So you wanted to do something that would make me not like you. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. You're going to get there yet. I'm going to, you're going to trust me. Mm-hmm. And then a natural consequence would be that you make sure a lot of those things are hidden in the house. Cause you know, Jenna can't handle yeah. having yeah. access to some of those things yet because the part of her that wants to sabotage, because the part of her that doesn't feel like she's in able to have a, a good relationship it's still growing and it's quite weak. It does a lot, needs a lot of support. I think about, um, vulner- high, yeah, w- the combination of wanting, like instinctually wanting to be safe or vulnerable with somebody at odds with the historical experience that that doesn't turn out safe, that it's so dis- it's so, um, it's so protective to sabotage. It's so protective to sabotage, right? So for parents to see that every behavior has a function 
makes us realize that our job as a detective isn't that it's, no, we've come across a behavior that doesn't fit that category. No, it's, we assume everything has a function. Then it means we just haven't discovered yet what the function is. So we keep working to come and show up as curious people in our kids' lives to go, I don't get it yet. It seems really extreme. I can't put my finger on how that's going to serve her or him. Like how, why, how does this help them feel connected? Right. For us to keep pushing at that storyline to, to go from the inside out. If a child has learned that isn't been safe in the past, of course they get, it's like, um, it's, it's the hangover, vulnerability hangover, right? We, we feel like we've overexposed ourselves and our only way to stay safe instinctually is to retreat and to cover up and to put up the barrier and to reject somebody else first before we feel rejected for having said something we can't take back, right? Like it felt safe to us probably as parents to get that amazing connective moment with our child. That doesn't mean they feel safe after they realize that just happened. They feel kind exposed and they feel, exposed, and they're worried, yeah. they feel, they're worried what you're going to do with that. And that's power in their mm-hmm. mind. That's power that they've given you. And I cannot stress enough that just because, you know, a child has not had a hard experience for many years, these things take so much time to heal because because the brain, the way we're wired up when we're younger, especially during those first five years of life, those are foundational experiences. And if we don't understand the severity of that, even it, because even if it's outside the child, especially if it's outside actually the child's conscious awareness because they don't have a language for it. So it's like this, mm-hmm. it's this behavior that they have that they don't even make sense of themselves. Okay. Our job is to is to stay at it, to give them hope, to give them this language, to help them make sense of their experience. That's where that curiosity piece really comes in. And then that empathy piece of, man, if you thought I didn't like you, or if you thought I was going to use the information that you gave me in a way to hurt you, that would be so scary. No wonder you don't want to tell me those things. And just helping them make sense of their story and letting them know that our shoulders are big enough for their story and that we're not going to leave them. Yeah. It's, the, it's almost like sharing the detective file. Like I've collected some of this information. Let's look through it together. I've noticed these things. Yeah. Wow. Look how much we're understanding together. No wonder, right? This is like that. We're in this together. This isn't a, I've detected what happened to you five years ago. And I'm going to tell you that it's the, I see you now doing things that make a whole lot of sense. And here's what I've learned, right? This And this yeah. is where we're going to go. And this is what I believe you have in you. And, and, and it brings the child into the conversation and it gives them agency because they have so often they don't have agency in a way that's healthy. But in, in this attitude, it, it's together. So it creates that unity. And it also yeah. creates, I am, I am an agent in my life. And, and I also... And I have the power to change and I have the power to do these things in my life and it builds their capacity to reflect. I mean, I mean, I think that's a superpower that we can give our, our, our kids, mm-hmm. you know, if they have some big response to anything, you can even reflect on that. Whoa, you're so mad about that. I'm really surprised what's going on for you. I think too often yeah. we assume the answer as opposed to asking questions. And yes. that's something that I've been doing in my personal life way more. I have biological and adoptive mm-hmm. children. And I mean, I, I live this on the day to day and I constantly have to remind myself that I don't know. I don't know always no. what's going on. And I use right. pace with all my children. Um, mm-hmm. Cause it creates it when they, when I'm reflecting on what, what's going on for them, they by default learn to reflect and check in with themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. a gift we can give them and ourselves as adults as, as we mm-hmm. ultimately we're giving them the capacity to practice awareness and presence and be able to tolerate some of these things in their life. That's a beautiful point to highlight. And I think probably where we could end because always, always I aim to end with hope and end with a, a power 
superpower. So you naming that, I love even that you use the term, the superpower. It, it reminds parents that this is not, we're not stuck. This isn't hopeless. This isn't forever. These are kids who have unbelievable resilience and we can tap that just as much as we can witness and bear witness to the hard stuff that's on display. Right. And so I love, I love it when we can name approaches that work, that people have used and have helped them and have resonated and, um, yeah, and just highlight that for people who want to read more about it. So I'll make sure that I put Dr. Hughes' book in the show notes as well so people can follow up there and read more about it if they're interested. Thanks for having the conversation today, Renee. appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on here. Always a pleasure to talk to you.